Take a look at this painting. Recognize it? How about now? And how about now? The painting is The Cliff Walk at Pourville by Monet. It's a painting of two women, one holding a red parasol, at the edge of a cliff in Pourville in the north of France, overlooking the ocean with a number of sailboats in the distance. Except it isn't. It's just a bunch of messy brush strokes in different colors. On close inspection, no single part of the painting remotely resembles real life. It's only when you stand far enough away from it that the picture of the two women on a cliff becomes clear. Nothing in the painting changes when you stand further away, the only thing that changes is your brain. The mess of brush strokes is still there, but at some point as you step away from the painting, you suddenly stop seeing a bunch of distinct details and start seeing a unified image. Monet was able to pull off this effect because he intuitively understood something about the way the brain works, specifically the two very different ways that we experience the world. In pop psychology, there's an idea that the two hemispheres of the brain run different aspects of our inner lives. Things like mathematics and logic are governed by the coldly calculating left brain, whereas things like art, music, and imagination are governed by the more creative right brain. This idea has been pretty thoroughly refuted, however. The brain is actually a bit more complicated than that. The difference between the hemispheres is less about what they do and more about how they do it. In essence, the left hemisphere takes a narrow, focused approach to the world, whereas the right hemisphere has a broader, more holistic worldview. The left hemisphere is inclined towards division, categorization, and abstraction. It sees the world in terms of generalizations and universals. It tends to create a kind of organized spreadsheet of the world, a map of distinct things to help you grasp and manipulate objects. The right hemisphere, in contrast, is inclined towards cohesion, experiencing the world and understanding it as a whole, accepting anomalies and idiosyncrasies as part of a larger picture. In a sentence, the left hemisphere is designed to help us apprehend and thus manipulate the world, the right hemisphere to comprehend it, to see it for all that it is. Duality is an important theme in many Eastern traditions like Confucianism and Taoism often represented by the familiar yin-yang symbol. The world can be easily understood in terms of opposites. Male and female, light and dark, crunchy and creamy. But the goal in many of these spiritual traditions is to, in some way, see past this division, to understand the world as a whole. In Zen Buddhism, disciples are asked certain questions called koans, which they contemplate in order to gain insight. These koans often appear on the surface as inscrutable riddles. But the questions are nearly always about the nature of duality and non-duality. Take, for example, the most famous koan. Two hands clap and make a sound. What is the sound of one hand clapping? The thrust of the question isn't really about hands. It attempts to lead the disciple to a deeper question, essentially saying, you're familiar with duality. You understand opposites, like hands coming together. Now, what's the nature of non-duality? What's the nature of oneness? The disciple is encouraged, it could be argued, to perceive the world with their right brain rather than their left. The tension between the left and right brain's views of the world is perhaps the most fundamental characteristic of our conscious experience. Learning something new begins in the right brain when it detects an anomaly, like for example if someone points out that something you believe doesn't make sense. The left brain doesn't even see anomalies, it tries to enforce its rigid, categorical viewpoint upon the mind. In fact, it gets very angry when something contradicts its view. Once the anomaly is acknowledged, the left brain can then go to work categorizing the new information, passing on this new understanding to be integrated by the right brain as a cohesive picture of the world. Both the left and right brain are necessary to understand the world by breaking things apart and putting them back together. If you're still watching this video, you might be wondering what any of this has to do with Elden Ring, so let's get to that. I don't understand the plot of Elden Ring. I've been through every item description and line of dialogue multiple times, and while I've been able to piece together a better understanding of certain elements of the narrative, some of the most basic and important parts of the story remain a mystery to me. Let me give you an example. Here are three things that happened in the timeline of Elden Ring. One, the Greater Will sent a star bearing a beast into the lands between, which later became the Elden Ring. Two, 
The Nox invoked the ire of the Greater Will and were banished deep underground. 3. The Outer God, Rot, was sealed away in a lake underneath Liernia by a blind swordsman. I have no idea what sequence these events happened in. They all seem to be pretty important and influential events in the history of the Lands Between, but there's nothing to indicate that one happened before the other. And this isn't unique to these specific events either. Take almost any important event in the story, and it's very difficult or even impossible to place it in a timeline. Beyond that, many important elements of the story are mentioned sparingly and described in incomprehensible ways. I know that the Crucible was the primordial form of the Erd Tree, where all life was blended together, but that description doesn't exactly clear things up. It isn't even clear to me whether Merica and Radigan, debatably the main characters of the entire story, are two separate people or one person, and what either of those would really mean. Questions like these are omnipresent in Elden Ring. Here's a list of all the important questions I have concerning the plot. You can pause the video if you're interested in reading them all. Previous FromSoft games had mysterious narratives. Who knows why Gwyn waged war against the dragons, or who Velka was, or what an Age of Dark really entails for the world and don't forget the furtive pygmy. But the main plot of these games, the progression of events, the motivations of the main characters, was never clouded in as much uncertainty as it is with Elden Ring. So I'm not going to try and explain the plot of Elden Ring, because I can't. However, I think that if we step back and take a broader view of the narrative, rather than being enmeshed in the details, we might be able to make more sense out of what's going on. Looking at the story of Elden Ring as a whole, there's one theme which cuts through every single aspect of the game, one idea that manifests in every part of the narrative, and it's this. There is something fundamentally wrong with the lands between, and that wrongness has to do with the way that things are differentiated from one another. If that sentence doesn't immediately make sense to you, let me lay out some examples to illustrate what I mean. The twins, Darian and Devon, have two bodies and two minds, but they share one soul. Melania and Mikola, also twins, seem to display opposing characteristics. Red-haired Melania is decomposing at an accelerated rate, whereas golden-haired Mikola is completely unaffected by the natural deterioration of age. Moog and Morgoth are also twins, born into the Omen Curse. Morgoth rejected the curse, although in his boss fight it manifests as a kind of golden wraith magic. Moog, on the other hand, took pride in his curse, and used it to wield the power of blood flame. Guarding the divine tower that holds their great runes is a different pair of omen twins who exist in a black void, one wielding blood flame and the other using golden wraith magic. As far as great runes go, they can be acquired by defeating shard bearers, but at the top of the divine towers are physical analogs to these great runes, which allow you to actually make use of them. These physical runes are held by the two fingers, but there also exist the three fingers, and it should be fairly obvious that two and three fingers combined make up a normal five-fingered hand. One instance of the two fingers exists in Round Table Hold. This Round Table Hold is located outside of this world, but an analogous location exists in Lindell. Lindell is covered in ash once the Tarnished burns the Erd Tree, which is accomplished by unleashing both the Flame of Ruin and the Rune of Death. The Rune of Death once gave power to a different type of fire, the Black Flame. The Black Flame incantations each closely resemble analogous incantations of the Flame of Ruin. The Flame of Ruin is unleashed either by sacrificing Melina or by using the Frenzied Flame, which Melina advises you not to do. Melina is a spirit who appears in a cloud of blue sparks, and she has one eye closed with a strange mark. Rani is also a spirit who appears in a cloud of blue sparks, and she also has one eye closed with a strange mark. Her spirit face appears almost identical to that of Melina's. Rani's power comes from her Dark Moon, which can be seen at the Moonlight Altar accompanying its twin in the sky, the Full Moon. In order to reach the Moonlight Altar, the player has to defeat Astel, natural born of the Void. Another Astel, Stars of Darkness, exists in the Yellow Anise Tunnel in the Consecrated Snowfield. This Astel performs an attack in which multiple clones appear and strike at the player. Further north in the Consecrated Snowfield is the town of Ordina, which is filled with the spirits of Albinorix and Black Knife Assassins. Inside the Everjail, these spirits have physical analogs. Like every other Everjail, the inside of the jail, so to speak, is identical to the outside world, except that the sky is dark and the Erd Tree can't be seen. Trapped in the Lord Contender's Everjail is Round Table Knight Vike, but Festering Fingerprint Vike invades you near the Church of Inhibition. 
The royal lineage Everjail contains a man called Godifroy the Grafted, who is identical in appearance and weapon to the shardbearer Godric the Grafted. Other duplicates exist in various places. Loretta is a blue spirit in Caria Manor and a physical presence in the Halig Tree. Godfrey is a golden spirit in the Erd Tree Sanctuary, but he returns in physical form later on in a boss fight. Halfway through that boss fight, the beast regent Sarosh begins to shift from a spirit form into a physical form. Godfrey kills him for some reason, and instead takes on the persona of Hora Lu. After defeating Hora Lu, the player can enter the Erd Tree, where golden-haired Queen Merica is imprisoned, but her body is commandeered by red-haired King Consort Radigan. Defeating Radigan transports you to a mystical lake with a multitude of golden tree trunks, which somewhat resembles the lake of petrified trees in Nokron. Nokron and the Eternal Cities worshipped the stars in the night, and their legacy is in some ways continued with the Carrions. The Carrions attempted to make peace with other races, the Trolls and the Demihumans, for instance. In contrast, the history of the Erd Tree is characterized by endless conflict. I could go on with this list, but I think the point is made. While some of these may have mundane explanations, as a whole, Elden Ring is full of strange occurrences of twins, duplicates, pairs of opposites, things that should be whole but are separate, and conversely, things that should be separate but are mixed together. The words I've avoided using up until now are causality and regression. Fundamentalists describe the Golden Order through the powers of regression and causality. Regression is the pool of meaning, that all things yearn eternally to converge. Causality is the pool between meanings. It is the connections that form the relationships of all things. These two incantations are the only mentions of causality and regression in the game, but clearly these fundamental laws are deeply connected to the strange coincidences I've listed above. The duality of the two and three fingers, and their masters, parallels these laws very closely. The greater will sent into the lands between the Elden Beast, which is the living incarnation of the concept of order. In contrast, the followers of the Frenzied Flame seem to be obsessed with chaos. According to Hayeda, all that there is came from the One Great, and then came fractures, births, and souls. The goal of followers of the Frenzied Flame is to incinerate all that divides and distinguishes, returning everything to One. In order to create order, you have to divide and distinguish things. A basket of laundry is chaotic, it's one big pile of undivided clothes. By putting the shirts in one place and the socks in another, you create order. You divide the indistinguishable chaos into separate categories. Those categories are based on the connections that form the relationships between things. The Frenzied Flame wants to remove distinctions, returning things to one big mess of chaos. Why is it a flame? Because removing distinctions is what fire does. Imagine you throw a couple logs in a fireplace. Each log has structure, form, individuality. By burning the logs, you remove what distinguishes them from one another, turning them into a single, formless pile of ash. Similarly, burning the Erd Tree to the ground destroys the distinctions which create its order. Burning the Erd Tree is the law of regression in action. The law of regression incantation can be purchased from Brother Corin, which makes sense given his affiliation with the Golden Order. But strangely, the law of causality is received from Gideon Ofnir. Now there could be a mundane explanation for this. Gideon collects knowledge and secrets of all kinds, and this could just be one more example of that. But I think there's a deeper implication here. I don't think it's a coincidence that this fundamental law, which governs how things are divided and distinguished, the yang or the left brain to regression's yin or right brain, is in the hands of a man whose only goal is to grasp and apprehend knowledge. The pursuit of knowledge is a theme present in many aspects of the game, like the conspectuses of the Academy of Rhea Lucaria, or Radigan's aspiration to be complete, and it ties in with the various alchemical associations throughout the game. But most importantly, it's a characteristic of Queen Merica herself. I declare mine intent to search the depths of the Golden Order. Through understanding of the proper way, our faith, our grace, is increased. Despite being a god, Merica sought to understand something about the way the world works, and this could be the motivation for many of her actions, removing destined death from the Elden Ring, or shattering the ring itself. Perhaps the whole story of the Lands Between is a story about understanding. 
As civilization developed, the inhabitants gained intelligence and turned their minds towards understanding the world they lived in. In order to apprehend, to grasp the structure of their world, they had to divide it and distinguish one part from another, break it into pieces. But these distinctions didn't just take place in their minds. The very structure of the world itself was shattered. One thing Miyazaki is exceptionally good at is matching the narratives in his games to the experience of the player. In Dark Souls, like in many games, you will die many times and repeatedly retry a challenge or an area. So in the story, the player character is undead. They literally die and come back to retry the challenge, which matches the player's experience of the game. Repeatedly dying to the same challenge might make you give up, which is the only real way to completely fail. So in the story, giving up makes someone go hollow. Although a hollow is still unable to completely die, like a character in a save file, they've lost consciousness, their will to act, which is what happens when the player shuts off the game or puts down the controller. This confluence of narrative and player experience is one of the major reasons that players get so immersed in FromSoft games. And it's present in Elden Ring as well, but in a much deeper way. The biggest change in gameplay with Elden Ring compared to previous titles is its open world structure. Players have more freedom than ever to choose their path through the world. And the world isn't just much bigger in scope, it's also more dense, varied, and complex. Meaning that what you as a player choose to spend time on can make your experience of the game vastly different from someone else's. Ultimately, your choices throughout the game will determine the ending you get. Each ending brings about a different order to the lands between, and the order you choose is a reflection of your experience in the game. Your understanding of the relationships between things in the story and their meaning is what eventually determines the actual relationships between things and their meaning in the lands between. In an interview with Miyazaki, when asked about whether the Elden Ring logo symbolized the different factions in the game, he responded with this. The rings that you're looking at in the logo are not so much a representation of those factions, as you put it, but more a representation of the law of the world, the rules, and the order. This golden order is something that the Elden Ring may have once represented, but not directly. It's more about how you apply those rules, and how you enforce them on the physical world, and what effects they have on it. This is ultimately what Elden Ring is all about. You, the player. Your vision, your understanding of the world. You seek the Elden Ring, the thing which determines the order of the lands between, how everything fits together in the world. But the Elden Ring is shattered, divided into distinct pieces. It's a mess of details that don't make sense up close. Ultimately, it's up to you to put the pieces together, to step back from the painting and understand it not as a mess of distinct brushstrokes, but as a complete and cohesive picture. A broken ring made whole.